Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the E3 Coliseum. I'm Jeff Keeley, and this is something really special. Uh, you guys remember Crash Bandicoot? I remember it very well. I was at E3 in 1996, my second E3, and I got to walk up to the PlayStation booth, and I played this game, Crash Bandicoot, and I just instantly fell in love with it. Um, and right now, this is something that has never happened before. I'm not sure it'll happen again, <laughs> but uh, we have a lot of the key people that built Crash Bandicoot um, with us. Uh, that game was made by, believe it or not, a team of nine people made that game over two years back in 1996. So let's bring them all out and we'll uh, have uh, the whole team here. Andy and Jason, the co-founders of Naughty Dog, Bob, Connie, and Mark. Great to have all you guys with us. So, 20 years ago, we're going to turn back the clock and talk about the making of uh, the original Crash. Um, you know, for me, I, I first met Jason and Andy when you guys were working on a 3DO game, Way of the Warrior, uh, for Universal. And, you know, Naughty Dog, obviously today, many of us play and love Naughty Dog games and, you know, tribute to you guys that you not only started the company, but I think set it up for great success. Um, you know, over the years, now with Evan leaving it, le leading it. Um, but uh, let me ask about, you know, the two of you guys. How, you know, we know that you met, you know, when you were kids, 12 years old. Um, you know, when we're building games all throughout, um, you know, late teen years and your 20s. Um, but tell us about, you know, Naughty Dog coming out to L.A. and then your interest in this PlayStation platform? Because I met you guys, you were doing a 3DO game, and then there was this new system coming out, PlayStation. Why did Naughty Dog decide, hey, maybe we should make a game for this PlayStation? Sure. Well, uh, we ended up coming out to California like after Way of the Warrior, because Way of the Warrior was published by Universal Studios, and they were starting up a new games team and offered a space on the lot, and we couldn't turn that down. So we were driving out to California and had this idea for a new game, which was kind of to take platform action games like uh, Mario or Yoshi's Island or Donkey Kong Country and put them into 3D. Uh, we didn't know the specifics, but it was sort of shaping out to be the gameplay that, that came to be Crash. And we were, at that time, we were looking at both the, uh, the Saturn and this new, I think it was even unnamed system that, that Sony had. And basically it just, on paper, it just looked a lot better. So we kind of contrived to get one. It just turned out to be really great. <laughs> Crash is here. Yeah, we, we had been pretty... Get a seat, Crash. We had been pretty successful with Way of the Warrior figuring out fighting games worked. Here's a system of the 3DO that doesn't have a fighting game. That was successful. So we thought, let's do a character action game. They're very well loved. <laughs> he wants to learn about there his creation go. too and let's, and let's find a system that doesn't have a character action game on it so that was kind of our interest in the PlayStation I remember Mark simultaneously was debating where we should be putting our efforts and came up with the PlayStation as his first choice too and that was probably a different discussion a different decision matrix because Mark at the time you were president of Universal Interactive Vice President. Vice President. Sorry. All right. So you were at Universal Interactive yes. and interfaced with uh, Jason and Andy pretty early on there. Yeah, so when I, when I joined uh, Universal Studios to, to uh, start off uh, game development, it was like, great news, we signed the Way of the Warrior guys. <laughs> and uh, well, no, Way of the Warrior was nice. And so, you know, we met, this was before E3, we met at, in Chicago, yeah. uh, CES 1994. And then what the heck are we going to do? Character action was looking good to me, too, because I was just coming off of uh, a couple things like Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, and PlayStation, I don't know. There was something special about it. That, that Ken Kutaragi dinosaur demo is pretty amazing. So I, I think we were all heading in the same direction. Yeah, and, and we, were, we said, look, there's not going to be a mascot for this system because they don't have Mario, they don't have Sonic. We'll make the mascot. And, of course, we didn't tell Sony that we were out to do that, right? We just set out to do it and got to Alpha without Sony knowing anything we were working on, really. I mean, it was, it was fun times. It was strange times, though, because, right, your, your team, you're just getting going. You've got, like, three people when you walk in the door, and I think eight the day the game shipped. 
and uh, you know, your mighty publishing organization, which was Universal Interactive Studios, had almost exactly the same numbers in it as we're all sort of trying to get in and, and, and break a big product. Yeah, and, and we outsourced design to like Joe Pearson and, and Charles Zembelis, and we had Universal's music group do the sound effects, Mike Gollum, and you know, we, Josh Mansell from Music Mutata did the music, so there was a little more than the eight of us that were I integrally working on it, or nine of us with you, Mark, but it was a tiny team. Now, Connie, how does uh, PlayStation get involved? You have uh, done so much for PlayStation over the years, so many incredible PlayStation games Connie's been involved in. Um, how did, you know, they were interested in the PlayStation platform, but then Sony took a keen interest, obviously, in this game and this team. How, how did that come about? There was so much excitement at Sony around this project, and I actually was not the first person to get involved. I was assigned as the producer as the deal went forward. Um, I was a member of the producing team. We had a large number of people at Sony who were interested in the project, and people around the world who were assigned to help guide the release of the product globally. Some of us are still working together today. Shu Yoshida was our She was in Japan, producer right? in Japan, yeah. yes, and obviously we're still working together today. Uh, it was a great, great team effort. Um, I was the day-to-day -day contact since I was in North America with Universal and Naughty Dog. I was the person who called Andy at 2 in the morning with crash bugs. Sorry, Andy. Uh, <laughs> but it was really a team effort. Yeah. No, and an incredible team. Uh, let's talk about the creation of the character, Bob, and the uh, team coming together around that. Because you guys said you wanted to do a character action game. But, uh, you know, as I think people know that have read the history, it wasn't always Crash Bandicoot, right? Uh, there were many other names and ideas, and I know, Mark, you were Wuzzles. working with, sorry? Wuzzles, the Wombat. Wuzzles, right, Wuzzles, the Wombat. Willie the Wombat. Willie the Wombat, all right. Well, well, we found a book on Tasmanian animals, and there was, you know, hedgehogs and uh, Tasmanian tigers and everything else in there. Tasmanian devil was in there, and we were like, this is obviously where character action characters come from. They come from Australia and Tasmania. So <laughs> we, we'll take one that isn't taken, the Wombat, because that sounded like a cool word. So we started with the that. Wombat. We're going to own that animal. We're going to own Wombat. Own one. That's, that was exactly it. It was like, when you think Tasmanian Devil, or you think of the Roadrunner, you think of the Warner Brothers characters. So we're going to own the Wombat. That is a great name, and we're going to own that. And so you know, we got Charles and Joe to start doing character sketches with Bob. And, and part of the way through it, we had a character uh, that was named the Pinstripe Bandicoot in the game. And we were trying to name this character. And Wuzzle's Wombat was the suggestion from somebody uh, at Universal, we hated that. Willy Wombat was a name that we knew by that time wasn't going to work. There was a game no, eventually no, that came out with it. It was taken. It was taken, yeah, and it didn't do that well. So we started to love this word bandicoot. And I think between uh, Dave Baggett and, uh, and Taylor Kurosaki, somehow we threw Crash Bandicoot together as yeah, the I name. I think it might have been uh, Kip, Dave's wife, who came up with Crash. Right. So it just kind of stuck. It just, it just felt good. I think the crash part specifically came from the fact that he was always like crashing and smashing through the boxes. And so that was one of his sort of fundamental activities. Yeah, yeah and the boxes are a great story. Um, we were going to E3 to show the game for the first time. And we were, I was playing it and it was, it was boring because you would kill the turtles and we only could get so many polygons on screen, so you right. could only have so many turtles on screen. And then there had to be a long distance before the next turtles, because you couldn't have too many turtles close to each other. So you were spending a huge amount of time just kind of wandering through these levels to find sparse jumps and sparse creatures. So we had to find something to do. And we came up with this idea of boxes because they're low poly and put boxes in. And I remember Mark came in and said, we have, we're going to the show. What the hell are you adding things last minute? And it, it ended up being Crash's thing, the box. Jason and I did it all on a Saturday. We snuck in and like <laughs> added them, basically. Because if like, you imagine the levels, like imagine Crash 1 levels and just take all the boxes out. <laughs> That's were you against the boxes, like. Mark? I love the boxes. I don't know where yeah. this is coming from. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they were one meter tall? They were, yes, they were meter boxes, can't recall, yes. It was a 12, scary 12 time. polygons, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, th the thing that, you know, was so amazing about Crash at the time was this idea of, you know, doing a 3D character action game, as you guys said, Sonic's ass, you were sort of calling it, because you were going to sort of look at it from a different perspective, at least he for some He came up with that. Sonic's ass, Crash. right there. Jason Rube. In <laughs> Illinois, I think. Maybe <laughs> Nebraska. And that was, you know, at the time was a very revolutionary idea, but, you know, this, you know, you got to remember back in 1996, you know, Mario 64, we were starting to see that. That was more of a, you know, an 
an open, expansive um, world, you still had this kind of you know controlled camera on sort of dollying through a level. And that restriction, again, we gotta remember back in 1996, is, as you were saying, Jason, it's like the number of polygons on screen really, you know, you had to make choices about what you were going to do. And that idea of sort of restricting the camera view in some ways, um, that allowed you, I think, to push the graphic fidelity of what you were doing in a really interesting way. Can you talk a bit about sort of, you know, that yeah, decision? Yeah, it was 3,000 polygons, give or take. Is so on the screen, at any point, you could only have 3,000 yeah. triangles. Wow. including Crash. Crash was like 500 some odd polys himself, wow. which is why the turtles had to be so low poly. Hmm. But we hadn't seen Mario at all. Mario 64 didn't get announced until very close to when we were going to E3 to show Crash. They first got shown next to each other on the yep. show floor. So as we were trying to design this game, the question is, how do you do a, a 3D character action game? We started with the side scrolling, but that's just more of what you used to do. Why does 3D make it any better? When we started thinking about going in and out, we realized you would be looking at the characters back the whole time. And that's where the Sonic's ass thing came from, because Sonic's backside isn't that attractive, which is why Crash starts looking at you on the first level. So you actually know who you're playing. Right. Goes through a couple of moves and then turns around. And then from that, everything kind of flowed. There's another very small nuance that radically changed Crash from Mario 64. We only had a digital stick. We didn't have an analog stick on PlayStation 1. Right. So up, down, left, right was the best controls. Therefore, our game is in, out, left, right. Mario had an analog stick. Mario 64 is more free roaming. And so the hardware drove our decisions. We also started like on some early level designs with more open levels. And we were trying to emulate the sort of fast paced, like very rhythmic gameplay of classic 16-bit uh, 2D platform games where it's like jump, 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 attack, jump, 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 attack. And in the big field, like you could just run around creatures. And so we focused it in deliberately in order to both save on the graphics and make, it, uh, make them higher fidelity and to sort of focus the gameplay so that the challenges came at you head on. So, uh, I mean, I remember trying to get the title out there, get some good press, was just brutal. I mean, we had one interview where the reporter says, first question, is Crash a real 3D game like Mario 64? And there's some, you know, song and dance about, yeah, I mean, this is all happening in 3D, and it adds a lot to the gameplay. Next question from the reporter, since Crash is not a real 3D game <laughs> like Mario. And I think it's amazing, it's amazing that it became, you know, the top brand for PlayStation 1, because it was certainly an uphill battle. It's amazing that there's this level of nostalgia for it uh, 21 years later, it just, it just blows me away. Yeah, sales did not take off on Crash 1. We did well out of the gate, but it was an ever-expanding kind of user base. And the part of the reason for that is we were not well-received by the press. There were, you know, the internet wasn't there for people to get independent reviews, so it was all game magazines. That's where you were getting your reviews. And the game magazine's attitude was somewhat, how dare you take on Mario? Like, how dare you even be saying that you're a mascot character? And we got reviews that literally knocked us a point because it's not Mario, right? And by the time we got to Crash 2, that had all passed. And then it was, oh, you're the Crash, Naughty Dog, Crash, Naughty Dog, Crash. And it just kind of had built on itself in that first year of sales. And Connie, on the PlayStation side, I mean, you know, Crash did sort of become a mascot, you know, the, the ads. I mean, I remember, you know, started with Polygon Man, but then all of a sudden Crash became this, this hero character. And tell us about that, that evolution of this relationship with Universal and Naughty Dog for this game, because it sounds like, you know, no one quite knew where it was going to go. Well, the first time we saw the product, it was playable. And I'll never forget that moment when we saw Crash turn around and go into the screen. I mean, it looked beautiful, he was adorable, but it was a jaw dropper to me that he went into the screen and I think it's, for me, it's interesting to remember that we were still trying to prove the PlayStation 1 back then, and we had to prove that there was a reason for a console to have 3D capability. And for me and for us, that was an absolute no-brainer. And Jason, I remember we were crushed when those reviews came out. What I remember most is that some of the press called us derivative, which yeah. I just couldn't understand because the word we use now is disruptive. We didn't use that then. But we thought we were doing something wholly original, and I still feel that way very strongly. Yeah, I, I mean, we kind of retrenched as a group because mm -hmm. the first reviews of Crash were very negative, and Crash went on to outsell Mario. All, all three of the, the main titles outsold the Mario titles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Jeff, cool. Take that, Jeff, Plumber Man. Jeff, you asked about, 
you asked about the marketing effort, and that was kind of dazzling to me. I had been with Sony for a while at that point, and this was our first big consumer product I had been part of. And we had uh, people like Andy House was running our marketing team in North America then. Amy Blair was our product manager. I think she's here today. Amy, are you here? I won't put her on the spot. Um, but it was a spectacular team, and they were really aggressive, and we loved the ads. Those were actually filmed in our parking lot. Oh, really? And, yes, and the, the character looked just like you, Crash. This Crash doesn't have his <laughs> megaphone, though, so. or maybe awesome. not, I don't know. And a risk and aggressive. I mean, for your first ad for this character that's completely unknown, to have the character standing in Nintendo's, what was supposed to be Nintendo's parking lot, <laughs> yelling up, hey, mustache man, I'm Crash Bandicoot, I'm here, effectively, and this is available online if you want to see it. That was a big risk, and Amy and, and Andy, I mean, that, that knocked it out of the park. That ad really changed the way people perceived Crash. That was huge, huge part of its success, as was the marketing effort in Japan, which changed Crash for Japan. I guess the joke's on me, because up, in, up until this point, I actually thought that was Nintendo's parking lot. <laughs> okay, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Maybe it's Don't believe what really you familiar. see on TV, Mark. <laughs> TV trickery. Uh, another thing that, you know, was really special about Crash was the animation system. And, uh, you know, a lot of you guys know Mark now, and he's on stage talking about, you know, place platforms. Back in the day, Mark, you wrote a vertex animation system for Crash in assembly, is that right? Yeah, that's actually um, just pinch programming because the, um, the lead programmer was like hooked up to an IV at the hospital three days before E3, and I had to okay. jump in and do something for the game. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there was a little coding there, but mostly I was I was trying to chip in on the, the design and layout levels and things. Well, but still, I mean, to be able to you know go into assembly, put this system together. But I mean, Bob, maybe you could tell us a bit about that. You know, the idea of this this animation of the character, and you know, using um, you know colored polygons versus textured polygons. I mean, all this stuff that you know again. Today, developers don't necessarily have to think about because they're un not unlimited, but you know, lots of resources. Back then, I mean, to get that look and feel of the character when you're dealing with you know 500 polygons, tell us about you know bringing Crash to life. Yeah, that was really the the magic for me. Uh, it, it was uh, using silicon graphic machines at the time, and I think Jason lured me to the company. He's like, "Well, you know, Jurassic Park, they use silicon graphic machines, so you should work with us." And I was like, "Yeah, that sounds like a good idea." So uh, we were doing uh, soft body animations, which is very commonplace today, and that just blew me away as an artist who was traditionally trained, and that's one of the things that made the, the game really special was uh, for the first time, it's pretty standard now, you would be crazy to make a game concept without uh, professional concept art, but we had professional designers, like uh, Jason said, Joe and uh, Charles, uh, to really help us uh, craft this organic look, which has become the, the foundation of uh, Naughty Dog's games going forward until today. They are known for really pushing every system uh, by doing these organic environments, which at the time were really difficult to do, like that whole pesky polygon limit was uh, a huge problem. And to do organic animation with, uh, soft, with every vertex uh, having uh, uh, a deformation to it was something incredibly special and just, uh, just inspired me and the rest of the team on the art side, a very small you know, pirate team that we had, uh, to do some amazing things. And it was one of those moments where we, we, there was nothing we couldn't do, you know? It's like, why not blow up the character and make him giant blowfish like we did with Crash? Anything was possible, and that, that's what made it special. The, the reason it was so important is everybody else was using bone animation, so everything was very strict, and then the face would be, uh, you know, ice. It wouldn't move at all because you had to have a bone to get it to smile and a bone to move the nose, a bone to move the ears. The processor just couldn't handle too many bones. But by storing vertices, we had complete control over the character. We used bones to animate it in, on the computer, but then baked out the vertices. And very quickly, it started animating by just grabbing the vertices and moving them around. And that's where all the death animations came from. I mean, when you see Crash's shoes, when he dies and he disappears and leaves just his shoes, the whole character is there, shoved into a single vertice inside the shoe, because I could control every vertice. So I could do any magic I could do with the vertices on every frame. And that allowed us to do things. You look at the squash and stretch, you look at the facial animations, you look at the death poses, everything. It allowed us to do things that no one had really done before, certainly in 2D, because it was all pixel-based, but in 3D, they were still using bones. And so that was a very, like all these little nuances became vital parts of the success of the project. But it was a conscious sort of resource choice. Like, we were doing a character action game, and Jason was basically like, the character is the most important. So he ended up, Crash had on the first game, about a third of all the polygons on the screen, all in the main character. And 
because we wanted to make him seem real, alive, cartoon, whatever he is, but have personality because it's a character action game. And so we put all these resources towards him. In fact, the reason Mark had a pinch hit and pinch program in there was because his animations took up too much memory. They wouldn't fit on the, uh, the memory on the production PlayStation. So he wrote this crazy compressor to like, ha you know, probably I think eight to one or something like that, like so that we could actually get it in the machine. And get it to E3, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tell us a bit about designing levels for that game. I mean, everyone remembers, obviously, the Boulder level or Hog Wild or all these, you know, there you go. Um, and, you know, what I think is interesting is you guys hinted at this before, Jason, about, you know, the, the challenges that you faced uh, in building that gameplay because you had this limit. So it's like, you know, an extra turtle means, you know, one less tree and sort of all that. And, Mark, I'd love your perspective first on this from a gameplay perspective. So um, the, the way that we did the design changed over the years. So uh, Crash 1, it was the artists who are free handing it in. And I want to shout out to, here to Taylor Kurosaki, who must have done a little over half of them, just free handing the levels into, oh. into what was it, Soft Image or something? Yeah, no, in other words, no real design. You just kind of uh, went at it. And then Use Photoshop as a layout tool. For Crash 2, I said I wanted to really get involved in design, and so um, you know, I set my target. Can I do? A, can I do a third of it? I ended up doing like 90% of the levels, and Jason did the last two uh, for that. But that was very different. That was actually graph paper then, and sort of a top-down view of it. And how are we going to snap together all of these cleverly constructed low-poly pieces of the world to create that gameplay? And then for Crash 3, of course, we had uh, Dan Airy and Evan Wells join. Uh, and the same strategy was sort of kind of split it up because that is a pretty heavy load to carry. Yeah, so I think the result was the first game is very uneven and way too hard. And we certainly, and, and there were a couple, there was one level road to nowhere that I designed that was unplayable. <laughs> and we have to keep making it easier and easier. And even the version that ship people hate to this day because it's too hard. Because I didn't know anything about level design. I was just hacking at it, right? Um, and then we made mistakes like making you earn lives. So. Good players had infinite lives because they earned them all, and bad players who needed the lives couldn't earn them, which was a huge mistake. Earn your save games. I mean, who came up with that? <laughs> <laughs> and earn lives. And then the second game, we took it seriously, and it was much more well-balanced and even. And the third game, I think we got to the point where we knew what we were doing and started having more fun, and it just kind of became uh, looser. My understanding is on the new game, they've tried to make the first game play more like the second game, so it isn't the original ass-kicking hard <laughs> Crash Bandicoot that we made. It was painful. Like it was, there were actually levels that were painful. I think two is the pinnacle of our, of our design work, and hopefully one now plays like that. And I remember that it was either Crash 1 or Crash 2, but Mark had the idea that maybe we should have people play the game who yeah. were not testers before we shipped. And <laughs> it was kind of, kind of a revelation. We, yeah, we actually would, um, if somebody spoke out of turn to meeting, maybe I shouldn't share this because they might not have realized it, but we would have them watch the 70 hours of VHS tape and create a manual heat map showing where every player died and, and that established rigor on the team. Yeah, but, but now we have... Shimizu had the top-down yes. map and he would put the little yeah. X's where you died. I was died, trying not right? to really? shout out yeah. to poor Shimizu-san for that, but yes. But, but now we have rooms full of PhD people, and they've made this into a science, and we're pulling that information directly from games. But for me, that was kind of pivotal. Actually, with Crash 2, I started collecting data for where they died, too, mm -hmm. and statistics for focus testing, which I think was probably fairly early and unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it, We were really hacking at it with the first game, and I, I remember there were areas that were just too hard, and I said, well, just throw a continue box in the middle, and Mark said, if it's one in 100 to get to the next level, it's one in 10 to get to halfway and one to 10 to get in halfway, it's gonna be a lot easier. And oh no, he's right. We, no one, we hadn't thought about that. We had no design background, so we were just. I, I just remember uh, <laughs> we, we've been developing and we could play it just fine. And then Shu Yoshida, who of course now runs the Worldwide Studio, but in those days was our Japanese producer and, and Connie's counterpart um, in, in Japan is he'd gone and done a play test. And so I was getting uh, the handwritten notes from these guys and reading them. And it's like, they're saying it's a beautiful game and I love the characters and it's too damn hard. And that is just, uh, that is an oops moment because we only had six months left. And despite really working on it, you know, that shipped as the most brutal crash game in the series. By far. The Japanese version was a little tuned down, actually. It was easier. We added some continue boxes and some more witch doctors and stuff. So 
going through some of the you know the levels and you know you even had some really interesting sort of you know two D levels, but with these characters like. I, I'm wondering. You said you hacked it, but that construction of you know thinking of like, oh, let's do a Boulder level or let's do a Hogwarts. Like, how did those how do those ideas come come about? I mean, were you guys just sitting around and saying like, oh, like Indiana Jones, let's do a level like that? I mean, do you have any stories about how these came to life? It, that that is actually pretty much how it went. We were, okay. we had <laughs> we we had the going into the screen, which yeah. was the trademark, but we weren't fully sure it was going to be awesome. So we had the left and right because we knew that worked because that was a classic character action game. And there was really only one direction left. I mean, we also had some vertical, but that was, again, like old games. So we had to do the in-screen. Like, it was the one thing that was left. And how are you going to do that? Well, people will just take a lot of time because you don't see what's coming. So they were inching ahead really slowly to see where the pits came up and then jumping over it. And that's not fun. We need something to chase them. Indiana Jones Boulder. And, and Hog Wild, which was potentially the first forced runner, which is now a staple of the mobile platform going into the screen was, let's just not let the player control the forward momentum. How does that work? Put them on a hog. <laughs> so From a we, level. Were, we were on the lot in those days at Universal. It was a lot of fun driving around golf carts and things. And actually, Amblin Entertainment, right? Steven Spielberg's company was three buildings down from we are, where we were making the game. And at one point, I don't think you saw this on the Naughty Dog side, but on the Universal side, because uh, Spielberg would come hang out a little bit is how do we tell Steven that we've ripped off his IP with the, <laughs> with the uh, Boulder. Temple of Doom boulder chase? <laughs> Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery? Exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure he's used to it. Were there levels that, you know, and ideas that didn't work out? I mean, we know obviously the levels that we saw, but I mean, were there any things that, you know, just oh, crashed Oh, God, and tons. There's yeah. far more game that didn't get in than game that got in. Our first level layout tool, as Andy said, we laid it out in Photoshop. The first tool that we built was a red pixel is a tree, a yellow pixel is a bush. They can't go in the same place because you can't have two pixels on top of each other. Then we have another layer for the boxes and stuff. And it was an open, kind of open world game. That didn't work from a polygon standpoint. So we, we had an, an early level that was a lava level, I remember, that was in an early video. But we realized Crash is lava color, no lava. There's um, actually a playable one sure. that shipped on Crash 1 that people on the inter you can find on the internet, and there's some hack to get it playable, like a different version of the rainy one. I think it's called Slippery Climb, or maybe that's the one that did ship. I can't remember. The, that's really difficult, and that's why it didn't ship. It was huge, the longest level in Crash, and very difficult. We didn't have time to get it tuned down, and so it's just on the disc, but not in the actual shipped game. Well, like, like Andy said, uh, the, uh, for using Photoshop as a level editing tool, was a burden and a, uh, a gift because uh, as a small team, it was going to be impossible to put these, you know, hundreds of thousands of polys uh, levels together. My, you know, mind you, we only have limitation of 1,300 per per frame. But uh, looking at uh, that that pixel vomit at that first or few levels was uh, that was my job and, and Taylor's job to look at that and try to to make sense out of it. It was uh, a mess, and the results were not spectacular. And I remember having but some... But by the end of the game, you saw through the oh, matrix, oh right? God, you yeah. could look at the when, Photoshop when file Dan and, Ari and see Evan, the level. When Dan Ari and Evan joined the company, they're like, how do you... What? I'm like, yeah, that's the... See, that range of colors but between 1 and 150. That means it's a ground level. That thing is an object. This shape goes here. They're like, uh, okay. So, yeah, it, it, was, it was a very challenging thing. But I think one of the things that saved us was using uh, out-of-the-box thinking and using Photoshop as a level editing tool that looks up RGB values of a pixel and turns that into geometry. Not to mention that if you changed one pixel to see the to see the new version, you had to run it for eight hours. Yeah, it got pretty sophisticated too. We had like uh, a color mapping onto it. We had like bump mapping added to it by Crash Two, I think. Uh, it was really uh, an amazing thing to work with, and and I had actually a good time working on it. So, how late would the levels get locked in a game like Crash? Because I assume you could build a level in a couple of you know a day or a couple locked, of weeks. Locked, locked. The day before it went to go. Were there Master. were there big shifts? Because I mean, could you sort of like a month before, so like, oh, let's scrap this level, let's build a new one. Like, how iterative was it towards the end? And Connie, I mean, from your end, I'm sure you had to keep them on track. I'm giggling. Um, yeah, I I think we did find a crash bug in the last boss in the game at two in the morning, the day we were supposed to gold master, and I think we ended up having to put somebody, might have been me, on a plane to pick up the gold master from Andy. Didn't we do the handoff? In I had to drive down to LAX down. frequently. Yeah. The way when, the when, when it got really bad, we'd put people on planes to Terre Haute, Indiana, where we made the, the game, but 
It was pretty late. One of the innovations with Crash 3 was internet fast enough to upload the disc. We actually had a stewardess that we would hand the, it was, it was too much to give the CD to the, go in and give it to United, which had the shuttle back then, mm -hmm. to give it to them and deal with it. So we had a, a stewardess that we would hand the disc to that would then, on the other side, hand the, for 50 bucks, she would hand the disc to someone from Sony. This was the fastest way to get things back and forth. And she was, you know, she, we were on the flights, the discs were on the flights, yeah, pre-9-11, do not try this now. <laughs> Um, wow, we sound old. The, the, other, <laughs> the other thing about the level building was that it would, again, it took eight hours to build every level, and what it was doing is it was drawing every frame that the camera could see, because the camera was on a path, a color for every polygon that it drew, and then at the end it would look for every color for every polygon and see which ones actually remained visible. So if you covered up a polygon, it wouldn't see it anymore, and it would take that polygon out of the draw list. That's great, but you get this draw list that is quite large. So then it would try to compress that. Tell me if I'm wrong on all this stuff, Andy. And it would go through multiple types of compression to see if any of them, because it was almost random noise, which one of them had the best possible output. And it could be this kind of compression for one level, another kind of compression for another level. And again, this took a long time. And every now and then you'd run it, and it would just say, no compression works. And there was no good reason for it. So you just have to take out a tree or put in a, and it would just work or not work in eight hours. So that was the level, actually the, the, the compression was deterministic, but the memory packing of the level was, was used to simulate annealing with a random element. Like that's what you're, you're talking about. Yeah, I'm, and I'm so starting to get bad flashbacks because they, we were working up to like, you know, uh, God knows what hours of the morning and just <laughs> waiting for that build and like, oh God, we gotta do it again, I need some sleep. And every computer in the office was SGIs. They all said it when they finished their part of the level because it was a, you know, networked back before networking was big. Level completed. So you'd hear level completed, level completed, level completed on every computer, and then you'd rush to see if it actually worked. And if something was out of place, you started over, and it was another eight hours. Eight hours. Yeah. Wow. So we were doing this up until the very last minute, but the very last minute had to be eight hours earlier, and you had to hope which really meant 16 hours earlier, and horrific. you had to hope. It was, it was, it was, it was horrific. horrific. If you had to rerun all the levels, that was like a two-day affair. Oh, God. Uh, you know, you guys made three incredible Crash games, and then, uh, you know, when PS2 came along, you were very public about the idea of leaving Crash behind and, like, creating this new universe, Jack and Daxter, for sort of the next generation. Tell us about that decision for Naughty Dog to, you know, sort of move on from the franchise, because I'm sure it was something that, you know, a lot of people wanted to see more games. For a long time, people were wondering, you know, would Naughty Dog ever go back? What would happen? Tell us about that decision to sort of, uh, you know, leave Crash behind. Well, I think there were a lot of reasons. I mean, one of them was just contractual and structural. We didn't, we didn't own Crash, Universal did. We were building it, Sony was financing it, yet money was continually falling out, if you will, to Universal. It didn't make a lot of financial sense well, for us to continue. To Universal. What's that? Oh, it, it made, made great sense to Universal. <laughs> it didn't make a lot of sense to us. And by that time, Mark was no longer with Universal. He was consulting with Naughty Dog directly, effectively a Naughty Dog part of the team. Um, and the other thing was Crash was made for the PlayStation. He, we, we felt, we, we did everything we could to make Crash work on the PlayStation. The reason he has black gloves is the lighting was so bad on so few polygons that he just was an orange mess and you couldn't track his hand crossing the rest of his body when he was running. So having black gloves gave you that visual cue. Like the way he had only a few spots on his back was because those were the polys we chose to have texture on. We couldn't texture all of them, and we knew it was Sonic's ass game. You were looking at his back, so we put the polys on his back, that, and that's where the textures are. Everything about Crash was made to work on the PlayStation 1. Size and of his head for the resolution size of that his you head. were working with, right? Size of his so eyes. So low. How, how low was the resolution there? 512, 240, is that right? We use 240p, the, right? Yeah, 240p, exactly. We use 50% more resolution than most PS1 games because we use the 512 mode. Yeah, they were 320. The 320, yeah. And, and running at less than 30 frames a second most of the time and V-blank issues and everything. I mean, it, it was a mess. So when we looked at the future, we thought, should we take this baggage with us or should we take advantage of what at that time looked like a supercomputer to us in the PS2 and do something that works for the PS2, open world, all these other things that were becoming trendy and I, we just made the decision for that and the business reasons to try something new with Jack. Plus after you work for six years like seven days a week you know 14 hours a day on the same thing uh, it seems creatively more exciting to try a new character 
and we actually tried to kill Crash. Like in CTR, we said, what won't anybody believe, because this is our last game? Let's put aliens in. We'll bring an alien. No one will like Crash after that, because there's an alien. This will be the end. We've jumped the shark. The alien came into CTR. Everybody loved it. <laughs> so, you know, it was, uh, you know, so many years without Crash, and now there's been this sort of resurgence. Uh, there's always been that nostalgia, but, uh, you know, Uncharted 4, of course, I, th I think by now we can probably spoil it, that there is a cameo from Crash, which was there. There's the, the new uh, remake Vicarious Visions is doing that's coming out shortly, looks great. Um, tell us about this sort of, uh, you know, this resurgence and interest in Crash. I mean, even something like popping up in Uncharted 4, I'm sure you guys had the inside word, but, you know, Connie, from your perspective, that must have been very, very special to see that happen. It was very special to see that happen, and it was, it was pretty close collaboration. We have a really spectacular third party relations team at Sony, and they work very closely with Activision. That's the team that has produced the new version of Crash. And when we were working on Uncharted 4, the team at Naughty Dog wanted to include that Crash cameo, and our third party relations group reached out to Activision. They gave us permission. I think there were a couple of things that, that we did in return. Um, I think Crash has a cameo in one of their properties, or maybe Uncharted does. And then, of course, the remaster came up as an opportunity, and we all got to see it recently. It looks spectacular. It's been a good experience. That was a surreal moment in my life, uh, playing uh, Uncharted 4. Did you, know, did you know that was happening? No. Actually, it was a, it was a very <laughs> awesome surprise, because I was like, oh my god, a, a character that I created is playing another character that I helped create, and, it's, it's, and I'm playing their game. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is really strange, and I couldn't, there was nobody in the room that I could really think, look, look, look. So. I, I, from the original eight, just Justin and Charlotte are still at Naughty Dog, is that right? So yeah. none of the three, you, you worked on Uncharted. One, Uncharted one. one yeah. Andy and I did not. So we had, we had left right as it was getting made. We sold the company to Sony and that was the end of our Jack and Daxter period. So we saw it being made, but did not have input into it. Uh, you know, obviously Crash now, there's so much interest in Crash and uh, you know, remaster people will get to relive those games, which is great. Do you think, you know, from your end, the character of Crash and the type of gameplay, is there room, do you think, for new Crash games? I mean, is that the kind of thing, like, the, you know, the concept of it? I mean, the gameplay in, in Uncharted 4 and even now, it's like it still, it still holds up. Um, do you guys think, I mean, would you like to see Crash sort of continue forward? New game? What, would that, what kind of games do you think that could be? Would it be real 3D? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Crash is his own character. He goes off and does whatever he wants to do. I think it's great that there's this nostalgia period where we're bringing it back, that 20 years ago is when I think a lot of people want to play with their kids now that played it when they were younger or want to play with their kids, remember the first game, so I think that's fantastic. There is a very good question whether or not Crash is a character that after the nostalgia of doing the games we've already made, do you take the character and do something new do something more contemporary that speaks to this generation of gamer. And I don't know. That would be a challenge. Right. Because again, we kind of left Crash thinking that he was PS1. Yeah. It was way too early for nostalgia, but it was also for us a little too late for that character to move into the world that Jack took up much, I think much better, and then eventually the Uncharted world that needed a more adult character, needed real world. It wouldn't have worked with cartoony characters to do Uncharted. It wouldn't wouldn't have had the same impact. I, I don't know if you go back and take a character from PlayStation and can make them relevant beyond the nostalgia. So that remains to be seen. I mean, I personally, Crash is a great character, uh, but he actually strikes this subtle balance that we managed while trying to, but to hit luckily at the time between sort of childish and a sort of postmodern irony. And so it's a tightrope. You actually kind of have to walk with him so as not to fall over into cheesy, like, or, or just straight parody, because that's not quite what he is. He's sincere, but also ironic. Like, uh, and when he hits those notes, like, you know, he's really appealing. Uh, I've taken so much time asking my own questions. I do want to give at least one person in the audience a chance to ask a question of this uh, team. Raise your hand if you have uh, a question. Um, not you, Crash. <laughs> Uh, maybe this guy right down here in the front corner. We've got a mic over to you. He's running down or coming from multiple directions. 
hey, how you doing? Um, I, I really love the first Crash games, uh, but like, I know you mentioned, especially um, the challenges of working on a new on new hardware and competition of Mario. What were some of the hardest points in development for the first game specifically? Oh God, just getting it on screen was a, about a 12 month process before we actually had anything that resembled a level. We went through a lot of trial and error, right, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the first level that was a keeper was the fifth level that was made, and it was about a six week process of think up something new, make it in Photoshop, check it out in Maya, play it in the game. Yeah, it was uh, some dark times. I remember some uh, closed door conversations. Re uh, hearing yelling from the other side with uh, Jason, Andy, and Mark, and uh, uh, trying to figure out what's going on. The rest was like, you think we're gonna continue? I don't know. For, for so, so a heartbeat, Crash Bandicoot was gonna be in cyberspace, right? Because we just couldn't crack the puzzle of how to do your entire background with 500 polygons. So cyberspace. Good. I remember there was stuff where it looked like it was white triangles, like that was gonna be the level. At one point, it was gonna be more. The, the first level yeah. that worked was I can't remember what it's called in Crash One, uh, but you're running around on sort of stone platforms, like in uh, in kind of a dark cavern, and you really. Basically, that one was the first one we made work because the, there really wasn't much of a background, just some sort of like stone things that kind of loomed out of the shadows so that we could focus on the, the gameplay elements. Because the, character, the animation of the character, yeah, making that actually work, yeah. Yeah, and, and we uh, uh, painted all the textures because we didn't have like lighting systems, like, you know, the, all the robust uh, game development tools that you have today. So we just uh, did all we could to maximize the number of, you know, the, using our uh, texture count. And it actually started to look like something that was promising. But, but I remember it was not a slam dunk whatsoever. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, but on behalf of everyone here, uh, let's give these guys a round of applause for the contribution they've made to the gaming industry with Crash. Thank you so much, Mark, Connie, Bob, Andy, Jason. Uh, Thank you. We'll see you guys in a few minutes with our next panel. Thanks again, guys. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you.